Thirty Years' War, 400 years ago, pitted Catholic Europe against Protestant Europe. And 30 years was pretty much what you would call a lifetime. A lifetime of war. Two ways to view the world so similar at times. Two ways to rule the world to justify the crime. Starting with the Protestant Reformation that kicked off a century earlier, by 1618, the Holy Roman Empire had grown deeply divided into Protestant, Lutheran, Catholic territories. But this mostly German empire, even though in reality more of a multicultural patchwork of many duchies and dioceses, was still technically an empire ruled by a single emperor of the Habsburg dynasty. And it was his duty to uphold the peace and the rights of his subjects. Emperor Ferdinand, however, who had promised religious freedom to the aristocracy upon his coronation, was going back on his word, and now pursued a new policy of re-Catholicization of his crown lands. In mainly Protestant Bohemia, this meant closing down Protestant churches and empowering the lesser Catholic clergy once again. For the Bohemians, this did not just threaten the open practice of their religion, but the actual real power of the mainly Protestant landowners. As their protests were repeatedly ignored, powerful Bohemian aristocrats finally came together against Habsburg rule. In Prague, the Bohemian capital, on May 23rd, 1618, they took action and threw the imperial officials out of the window. Yep, this was the second defenestration of Prague. The word comes from fenster, the German word for window. So to defenestrate is to chuck someone out of one. Okay, with this symbolic defenestration, they had, in actual fact, openly declared war on the authority of the empire. For the Czech patriots and anti-Habsburg radicals, this was a welcome chance to take up arms. Rebellious provinces sprang up all over. They secretly raised militias and hastily organized detachments of Bohemians, Moravians, Hungarians, Silesians, and hired mercenaries fell on imperial outposts and blocked their supply lines, hoping to gather support from yet other provinces with a series of quick successes. Protestant rebels even stormed the Hofburg in Vienna in an attempt to physically seize the emperor and force him to sign their demands. The rebels rejected Ferdinand and the imperial constitution and wanted a commonwealth of their own, like that of Poland and Lithuania, led by their own king in a constitutional monarchy. Their uprising failed, however, as the Habsburg emperor was not without friends and support. Imperial propaganda portrayed the Bohemian uprising as arch treachery that disturbed the peace of the empire, and many staunchly Catholic dukes pledged their allegiance to the emperor. Ferdinand had been caught off guard, sure, but he had no intention of giving up the crowns of Hungary or Bohemia, which might even jeopardize the structural integrity of his whole empire, and he was determined to go on the offensive, to quell the rebellion with fire and sword. itself seems at first like localized rebellions over cultural and religious differences, but in reality it revolved around the future of the Holy Roman Empire, which was the primary Christian religion. Who had the power, the emperor or the dukes and their possessions? Political unity under one belief, or, or even more fragmentation with religious liberty? Ferdinand's strongest ally came from Bavaria. The zealous Duke Maximilian re-established the Liga covenant of Catholics and raised an army with the blessing of the papacy. Under the command of his paladin, the Count of Tilly, they were eager to take the fight to the Protestants and forced them to battle in late 1620. The Battle of White Mountain was one of the first major engagements of the war and one of the most decisive ones. Tilly's forces, better led and supplied than their enemies, won a major victory and then took Prague that winter. But as kings and dukes quarreled over cities, estates, and property rights, for the common people living in Prague and the villages along the trail of armies, the horrors that accompanied war became reality. And this was not a temporary situation, because this war is called the Thirty Years' War, because that's how long it lasted. And it is often said about the war that the longer it went on, the more the violence and cruelty intensified, but really, the seeds of uncontrolled violence were already planted in the early stages. 
Discipline among the common soldiers was usually pretty low, and more so on the side of the rebels. Irregular forces particularly raged among the local populations. Polish skirmishers, Hungarian raiders, and Croatian cavalrymen terrorized panicked peasants and refugee columns. Marauders and bandits roamed alongside the marching armies, and the enlisted soldiers were often not much better behaved. Especially after long and dangerous sieges, when pumped up and often drunk soldiers had been forced to storm a city under fire, they would afterwards take out their rage and fear on the locals. From house to house, they plundered and stole everything they could carry. If they did not find anything, or if others were quicker than they were, because it was first come, first serve when it came to plundering, they would turn on the helpless citizens. Men, women, and even children were brutally tortured for the slightest chance of hidden valuables, since this was often the only way the soldiers could make actual money to feed and equip themselves and their families. They could not afford to show mercy. Many simply embraced boundless, unchecked violence as a new way of life. The fall of Prague marked the collapse of the Bohemian Confederation, but the war itself obviously did not end, as the triumphant Ferdinand failed to take advantage of his victory. He would not listen to any compromise of his demands to restore his full authority. There was no chance for religious equality after the revolt, and instead he condemned captured rebels to an agonizing death, while the escaped ringleaders were under an imperial ban. 